Welcome back to Let's Talk Sports Radio right here on 94.9 Bob FM. Joining me now, mixed martial arts reporter out of Toronto, Ontario, Canada, representing TSN, friend of the show. You know him already, folks. Aaron Bronstetter tonight, fight night 161 in Tampa, Florida, the main event. A really good fight at Women's Strawweight, Ioana Janjacek versus Michelle Watterson. And a co-main event at Men's Featherweight, Cub Swanson versus Cron Gracie in his second uh, UFC fight. Aaron, first and foremost, thanks for joining us. Of course, my pleasure. So there's a little bit of drama going into this fight leading up. If you're a sports fan, if you're a UFC fan, uh, Ioana comes out at the beginning of the week and she says, uh, I told the UFC uh, prior to this a few weeks back that I might not make weight and then all the drama, Michelle Watterson comes out and says, well, I want to fight her. I'm not going to fight her at a catch weight. I'm not going to take a, a backup fight. I think uh, there's a few other fighters you can fill us in who were on call. Then it turns out the ladies weigh in and they're both on weight. So uh, tee up this fight tonight because there was a little bit of drama going into it. All right. So just because that was based on a report. So you want to never really came out and said that, that that's exactly what happened. I did speak to her earlier this week. And she acknowledged that there was an issue that happened a couple of weeks ago that made her, I guess, worry that she might not be able to make weight. Um, the report is that she vocalized that to the UFC, um, pitched a catch weight fight. Watterson's camp refused. They then tried to potentially get Angela Hill lined up in case um, Joanna wasn't going to make weight so that uh, she would replace Watterson if Watterson was unwilling to do a catch weight. And uh, they apparently also offered. Um, Amanda Rebus and Mackenzie Dern as prospective opponents to Watterson. Uh, and uh, she turned them down as well. They're both on the card fighting at 115. So they could have, uh, you know, been on call for that particular fight. Um, so essentially it becomes a non-story because Joanna, I guess, gets motivated by these reports leaking out that she uh, was looking for a catch weight and was having trouble with her weight and then just goes, goes ahead and makes weight with the help of the UFC PI. Um, I, I guess the, the workers from the UFC PI that are on site at all the different events helped her out with her weight cut. And, uh, yeah, fight's good to go. So, main event, Ioana and Jacek, Michelle Watterson. Uh, and it's, it's a good one with pretty high stakes. Yeah, that was my next question. Who has more to lose here? Of course, Ioana coming off the, the loss uh, in Toronto for the vacated uh, women's flyway title to Valentina Shevchenko. Um, and then you have Michelle Watterson, who's on a three-fight win streak. Uh, it's a We're looking in terms of rankings uh, Ioana's ranked five. Michelle Watterson's ranked seventh. Um, who has more to lose here? Could this potentially be uh, like a, a title eliminator for uh, for the UFC's women's strawweight bout, which was recently won by Wei Li Zhang? Well, Ioana told me that she does have it in her contract that she will get a title shot if she does win this fight. And I'd imagine Watterson probably has similar wording in her contract. She's been talking about getting a title shot for some time. So the stakes are high, uh, as mentioned, but I think that Ioana has more to lose. I mean, Ioana has a legacy right now to maintain. For her at strawweight, the only person she's lost with strawweight is Rose Namajunas. She lost to Valentina at 125, but in terms of her strawweight legacy, I mean, she was undefeated for a long time, had a big winning streak, had five title defenses. So if she were to lose to Michelle Watterson, who I think is kind of on the fringes of the top five of the division at best, um, you know, she's she's a very small uh, strawweight, and I think that Ioana is better than her, you know, especially in the stand-up. Uh, we'll, we'll be able to outclass her, and that, that's the expectation going into this. So if she's unable to meet those expectations, I think that uh, it'll, you know, her legacy will take a pretty big hit. I wouldn't be surprised if you know, she, she decides not to stick around if she loses this fight, honestly, because I think that the climb to get back into championship contention for her would be pretty steep if she does lose this fight. And in terms of the actual fight itself, you look at, of course, uh, Ioana, former uh, Muay Thai uh, champion uh, Michelle Watterson. Many of her her fights have gone to you know she likes to take it to the ground, decision, whatnot. Uh, stylistically, it should be uh, very good uh, for you know people in the stands and people at home in terms of a chess match. She's a very strategic uh, you know stand up uh, striker versus uh, someone who likes to take it to the ground. And Michelle, but Michelle Watterson can also strike. She's got a very good arsenal of offense. Yes. Yeah, they call her the karate hottie for a reason. She's great at karate, great at stand up. Um, Pretty good distance control, but I think that there are levels, and I think that Joanna's striking level, you know, in terms of anybody in the division, she's probably the best striker. Um, you know, people can say Rose beat her twice, knocks her out once. I get that, but in terms of just striking credentials, I think Joanna's at the top. And um, sometimes matchups make fights. You know, when when Rose and and Joanna were matched up, I thought that it was a 
a bad matchup for Ioana, even though Rose, Rose was a pretty sizable underdog in the first fight. And I said, you know, I think that Rose is going to be able to get her down or, or you know, if, she, if it gets to the ground, she'll be able to sub her. Knock her out, I did not think she was going to do. And, and she did that in the, in the first round, which was shocking at the time. Um, but, you know, Ioana is looking to bounce back. And uh, I think that, again, in terms of the striking, I, I just see her having a very sizable advantage over Watterson. And in terms of Watterson being able to get her to the ground, again, Watterson's size is is not very big for this division. And Ioana hasn't been really held down by anybody at straw weight. Uh, she's been taken down, but never kept down there. And uh, that frustrates a lot of opponents. And over the course of five rounds, that kind of thing can be very grueling. So I don't think that Watterson is going to have a really strong grappling attack as her plan. I think that uh, if, if the opportunity arises, she'll definitely seize that opportunity. But I don't think that she's going into this fight looking for a grappling-heavy attack. I think she's going to probably try to control range, um, use her karate to um, keep Ioana on the outside and, and try to outstrike her there. But, you know, I posted an interesting stat on, uh, on my Twitter page, which was the striking differential between the two over the course of their career. And Ioana's is like plus 700 and something. Yeah, plus 730. And Watterson's is plus 39. Now, Ioana's had 12 bouts, most of which were five rounds, and Watterson's only had seven bouts. But that's still a pretty staggering strike differential. You know, in a per fight, the strike differential for her is plus 60, and for Watterson, it's plus 5.6. And then just generally, like when you break it down statistically, she lands 6.07 uh, significant strikes per minute, whereas Watterson lands 3.61. So nearly double the amount of strikes landed per minute by uh, Ioana and Jacek, and Ioana also absorbs less per minute. So, uh, you know, again, just on paper, I mean, you look at these numbers, I think that uh, it favors Ioana, whether it goes to a decision or ends inside the distance. I think there is one, if if somehow Michelle Watterson does pull this off, I think there is one women's strawweight who does have a beef if, you know, Michelle Watterson does get perhaps hot shot into a title fight. Wouldn't that be Tatiana Suarez, who's undefeated and just coming off a win over Nina Ansaroff? Shouldn't she be in consideration for a women's strawweight title fight? Well, I think Tatiana would have a beef regardless of who wins. Um, but at the same time, you want to, uh, sorry, uh, Tatiana's injured and has, has just started um, tr- training. She's not even cleared for sparring yet. So I think if they want to turn uh, Zhang around quickly, that it's in Tatiana's best interest to kind of wait on the sidelines and face the winner of whatever that fight is. And I think that she's probably there in terms of the uh, the rankings um, and in terms of title contention. So that's probably how it will play out. Now, that being said, just because Ioana is guaranteed a title shot if she wins or, or Watterson, is, if that's the case with Watterson, that doesn't mean it's the next title shot. It just means that they're guaranteed a title shot at some point. So that doesn't preclude Suarez from getting the next shot. Uh, it would just mean that whoever wins the fight would have to wait until the outcome of that fight. So I think that's one thing that a lot of people kind of jump to a conclusion is that, like, because someone's promised a title shot, it means that it's the next title shot, which isn't always necessarily the case. They might even have Suarez versus Zhang agreed to at this point in time, but I, I doubt that, obviously, because I think Suarez wouldn't be cleared at this point in time. But that's just something to think about, you know, when a lot of people will be like, oh, they, they promised her a title shot. Well, that doesn't mean she's not getting one. It's just not right away. All right, let's look at the co-main you have uh, Cub Swanson, 25 wins and 11 losses. He's on a four-fight losing streak, Aaron. Of course, this is at men's featherweight, and he's going up against one of the, the na- one of the names that's synonymous with mixed martial arts, Cron Gracie, undefeated. Of course, it's just his second fight in the UFC and undefeated as a professional. Um, what do you think about this? Of course, every you know when you hear the see and hear the Gracie name, you get a little bit hyped just to see the next generation of martial artists entering the professional ranks. And, uh, you know, Cron, Cron Gracie uh, looked uh, pr- looked pretty good in his first fight, yes? Uh, yeah, Cron looked great in his first fight against Alex Harris. But you've got to keep in mind that there are there are levels to this. And if you look at just the pecking order of the featherweight division, like I think Caceres was basically a tailor-made opponent for Cron to beat. You know, he's not going to challenge him that much on the feet. And then, he, you know, he does like to grapple a little bit, and Crone, that's Cron's world. Cubs Swanson, you know, you mentioned the four losses in a row, and I think that that's a, a big reason why – the line is where it's at, where why Cone is a pretty sizable favorite. Because, but if you look at who he lost to, you got Brian Ortega, you got uh, choked out by Brian Ortega, got choked out by Renato Moicano. So seeing those two submission losses automatically makes people think, wow, like, well, he's fitting, fitting a Gracie. That's not a good look. Other losses, a uh, unanimous decision to Frankie Edgar, and then a split decision to Shane Burgos in a fight that really should not have been a split decision. It was a fairly one sided fight in Burgos' favor, in my opinion. Um, but again, it's, it's about who. You know, if you lose four fights in a row, uh, a lot of the time you get released from the UFC. But if you're fighting the top of the top competition, I think all four of those guys are top 10 featherweights in the world. 
Um, and now you're facing a newcomer, basically, in Cronin Gracie, who's had five professional mixed martial arts fights. Um, you know, what, I'm not saying that that, that means Cub's going to win the fight necessarily, but uh, I do think that um, he's got a lot more um, of a resume than, than Cronin Gracie. He's got a ton more experience in, in mixed martial arts than Cronin Gracie. And, uh, you know, if this fight stays on the feet, I think Cub's going to have a pretty sizable advantage over Cronin Gracie. I know Cronin trains with the Diaz brothers and with uh, Richard Perez, who's his boxing coach, and um, he's been working on that part of the game, but Cub's been in this game for like 10, 15 years. Like, you know, you know, Cub is no joke in that regard. So, um, and you also have to keep in mind that before the four fight losing streak, Cub was on a four fight winning streak, right? So things change. And, um, I do think that Crone probably is the rightful favorite in this spot, but I wouldn't go anywhere near it if I was looking at this card. And if anything, I would lean with the underdog Cub. All right. And then you have, uh, a few other good fights. This is not a bad card tonight. It looks like uh, James Vick goes up to welterweight for his first fight after losing three in a row. Two of three, really, really, uh, uh, some of some very, very, uh, I guess you would call them, you know, uh, jarring knockouts. Um, and so, what do you think about uh, the fight here? Uh, we're looking at, of course, uh, uh, James Vick versus Nico Price at men's welterweight. Well, this is kind of a wait and see for me because, you know, as you mentioned, his chin has been uh, rocked in two of those three fights. And now he's going to be facing a bigger opponent in Nico Price who hits really hard and is not, I'm not afraid to get reckless. Now, the thing about getting reckless against James Vick is that he's, he's very good with his timing. He's very technical. And looking at how Vick looks at 170 on the scale, he's a big, he's even a big welterweight now. He was a huge lightweight. Now I think he's even a, uh, you know, on the bigger side for welterweight. This is where he should be and probably should have been all along. And I don't think his, I think that obviously his success at lightweight kept him at lightweight. But I think that um, this is probably a better division for him. I think he'll be healthier here. And in terms of just as, as a fighter, I think that James Vick is more well-rounded than Nico Price. But, you know, if, if you're going to side with James Vick on this um, fight, you really need to proceed with caution because he's gonna, if he gets hit by Nico Price, who hits really hard, He's going to get hit by a guy who's much bigger than what he's used to getting hit with. Now, of course, he'll be more hydrated than he's used to, so his chin will probably be better as a result of that. But, uh, again, that's, that's basically what you're betting on. You're going to bet on James Vick just being able to outsmart Nico Price over three rounds, which is very, very possible. But if he gets tagged and hit, you just never know with what we've seen from him. Now, that being said, the two knockouts in question are um, Justin Gaethje and Dan Hooker, and those are, like, two of the best guys at lightweight. So, again, sometimes you've got to look at who is beating them rather than how and and uh, rather than um, what the actual numbers are like him losing three in a row that's great but he's losing to t- some of the top talents of that division now he's moving up a weight class and facing somebody who's you know kind of in the middle of that division he's not a ranked guy so I think that that's something to look at for this particular fight I think that Vic is a more talented fighter but uh, you're gonna have to trust in his chin and you just don't know what that's gonna be like at welterweight. Good stuff. That is TSN's mixed martial arts reporter out of Toronto, Ontario, Canada, Aaron Bronstetter. Aaron, first things first, are you in Tampa or are you in Toronto for this one? No, I'm in Toronto for this, and I wish I was in Tampa because the weather's a lot nicer. But uh, even though Tampa, have you been to Tampa? I haven't, but it's 90 minutes away. I was going to say, come get a direct flight to Grand Cayman. We could have a few uh, rum punches. Yeah, well, I mean, I wouldn't be able to shirk my, my responsibilities, but, you know, I always could have had, like, a redirected flight, uh, in, in quotes, on the, on the Sunday mm-hmm. that, that got me there. But, uh, yeah, Tampa's uh, it's not the best city. I'll, I'll just put it that way. It's not, not the nicest city, but um, there's better places in Florida to go. But uh, either way, fun fun card, and uh, I'm really looking forward to this main event. I think all the drama surrounding Ioanni and Jacek this week actually made this card seem so much bigger than it, than it is, and uh, it makes me look forward to it even more. And we are always look forward to hearing from you. That's Aaron Bronstetter, mixed martial arts reporter. Thank you as always, Aaron. Hey, my pleasure, Jordan. Anytime. All right, more Let's Talk Sports Radio right here on 949 Bob FM. Stick around. 949 Bob FM. And we're back. Just like that. We're back. Welcome back to Let's Talk Sports Radio right here on 949 Bob FM. Connell, once again, good morning, sir, and welcome. Your debut appearance on Let's Talk Sports Radio, episode 19. Is your family and friends and your colleagues all listening right now? Get nice and close, please, sir. Br- pull a that. Se- a select group. A select group. Only people I can trust. All know, right. There's a trust tree here. <laughs> you know, I don't. I don't want people, you know, who who are going to slag me off. I want a very positive pro Connell, pro radio crowd. So this, you know, the podcast will go out to a select group. Fair enough. Well, let's start with what we do know. What we do know. And this just doesn't apply to the Rugby World Cup. You know, it applies to Suzuka, Formula One this weekend in Japan. Her, uh, Typhoon Hagibis has rocked the area, thus canceling 
yesterday's New Zealand-Italy game, as well as the England-France game, which was scheduled for today. Uh, you know, some would say for New Zealand, if uh, reports say rather that, you know, if New Zealand needed points to advance, the game would have happened. But uh, that's just, you know, the Italian uh, the Italian national rugby 15s are a little bit upset. Uh, what about English fans? Are they upset? Ta- let's start with what we know, and that's games are being canceled because of Typhoon Hagibus. Who does his favor? Yeah, well, I mean, the, the, the pool stages have come to a close now, and to be honest, they were ebbing and flowing along. The results were going according to plan, and then all of a sudden this last weekend of the pool stages has been thrown into disarray by this storm. Um, not the tournament organizer's fault. This is, as we would call it in the Caribbean, a Cat 5 hurricane coming in from the Pacific. It's not to be messed with. Um, it's hit Tokyo, I think, in the last few hours. Um, to be honest, out of the four teams you just named there, England, France, New Zealand, Italy, uh, three of those four teams don't really care about this. This is a big advantage to them because they get their weekend off. They have 14 days coming into the quarterfinals. Bruised bodies from the group stages are going to get rest. It is just poor little Italy that are going to get stomped on here. My which people. Is, well, your people. I knew this would hit you personally. <laughs> um, I know. My dad is very upset. He has no idea this is even going on. But <laughs> yeah, but I mean, I, I, I think, as in, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw the conspiracy fe- feelers out there. Mm. I think that the suits in World Rugby sat down here and they made a call, a judgment call, which came down to dollars. And they said, well, out of these four teams, three of them aren't going to kick up a fuss. Three of them are heavyweights in the world rugby game Mm -hmm. and Italy aren't uh, and let's be honest Italy aren't going to beat New Zealand uh, so let's just take our look or take our move here on Italy they won't complain too much and we'll move on Um, which is you know a huge tragedy for a couple of Italian players in particular Um, the captain Sergio Parise uh, has played for 15 years he's been an incredible servant to the game he deserved this to be his you know his final curtain Mm -hmm. same with the hooker Geraldini um, you know, so he apparently broke down in training, crying afterwards, as you would. You know, this guy came back from a serious um, career-threatening injury just to really play in this game. Now, people might say, look, it's, it's tough luck. It's, a, it's, you know, out of their hands. It's an act of God. But on the other hand of that is, you know, this tournament has been in the pipeline for four to six years. Mm-hmm. There are just other the games. ninth World Cup. Just the ninth Cup. World Cup. And, you know, fair play to World Rugby. They've, they've tried to move it away from a tier one nation. They want to spread the gospel, uh, you know, bring it to a new nation, bring it to new territories, and that's fine. But they've picked a time when it is hurricane season. Mm-hmm. You know, this was in the, this, there was contingency plans for this, although it seems not great contingency plans because there are games going on. Ireland played Samoa this morning in Japan, down the south of Japan. The question gets asked, why couldn't these four teams have been flown down to the south of Japan to alternative venues at the start of this week? And then the tournament's integrity would have been kept intact. Mm. And I mean, I know that's what the Italian argument is. And that's what, as you say, Sergio Parisi was saying. He said, well, hold on. If New Zealand needed these points, this game would have gone. They would have found a way and they would have signed the check for the move, for the logistics and the stadium. Mm. And I think it's a fair point. And it's, you know, it's going to rankle for a long time with them. Well, yeah, as I said, the, that point about the Italians not kicking up too much of a fuss. Mm. If this game tomorrow between Japan and Scotland doesn't go ahead, there's going to be a whole lot more noise about this because Scotland do have influence at the highest levels of world rugby. Their senior um, official has already threatened legal action. They're not going to go down without a fight. Um, so there's a decision being taken tonight, our time, about a pitch inspection in Tokyo. And I really hope for the integrity of the tournament and for uh, our Scottish friends on the island that that game goes ahead. Because and of course, because Scotland is in third in Pool A and Japan is in second, right? Exactly. So it, it's, it's a knockout game. Ireland have won this morning with the bonus point. They are in the quarterfinals. They wait to see what 47 happens. to 5 against Samoa. Correct. I mean, it was, they, lost, they actually had a guy sent off, Bundy Aki, in the first half, but they still cruise. Samoa weren't at the races. They look kind of tired. Um, but this J- Japanese Scottish game, it's been looked forward to by a lot of people for a long time. I really hope it goes ahead because you know, I think it will leave a sour taste in a lot of people's mouths if this tur- this game doesn't go ahead. Even the Japanese, they're very proud uh, people. They won't want to kind of almost limp into the quarterfinals with a, a shadow over it. You know, they want to win on merit, and the chances are they have a very good chance of beating Scotland on merit. I think it'll be a very close game. But you know, please God, the weather gods. Um, you know, look kindly on the game tonight and it actually goes ahead. And how nice would it be for the host Japan to finish off, 
you know, the opening rounds undefeated. Yeah. I mean, and that, would that, would that, because Ireland sits atop Pool A with three wins and a loss, would that, that would obviously favor their draw going into the knockout rounds, yes? Correct. So, I mean, Ar- Ireland, from a salvage point of view, um, and I will What be part so- of Ireland are you from? I'm from North County, Dublin, a place oh, that was my, that was my guess. Cost, Cost of Del Scaries. Yeah, you knew all about it. Um, <laughs> So, so basically, Ireland, from a selfish point of view, wants Scotland to win this game um, because Ireland do not want to play New Zealand in the quarterfinals. That mm. would be most certainly a, a plain home next Saturday. So uh, we want Scotland to beat Japan. Um, obviously, for the tournament, you want the host nation there. So, I mean, the chances are Japan could beat them. They're playing really well. They beat Ireland convincingly. So, you know, it's a real 50-50 game. Um, I just hope we get to see it. All right, let's take a look. Uh, so, of course, we have uh, today... Uh, a few games going, or one game already happened. You have Namibia versus Canada. Canada, and of course, my land of origin. Where we haven't got our first win yet, but we are an emerging nation when it comes to rugby, at least in the Americas. I mean, you saw it here over the summer if you saw Sevens. And, uh, you know, in these Americas regions, you know, even you look at the Cayman Islands, you know, it's still a developing sport, but gameplay is what's most important. You need to play games. And, you know, although Canada successful in the region, getting smashed in Pool B, uh, you know, just looking to save face. Two, two lo- uh, winless teams square off to not finish fifth in Pool B today. Yeah, look, I mean, it's not the game everyone's going to be talking about, but it's very important for the players involved. Both teams have taken, as you say, pummelings in the first few games. They played against, you know, two of the best teams in the tournament, New Zealand and uh, South Africa. They definitely upheld their honour. They fronted up physically. Um, but you would have to imagine that they're going to be kind of limping into this last game because, I mean, the physical toll of playing against these Tier 1 nations in the space of 12, 13 days as well is going to take its toll. But, I mean, it's a huge occasion for both teams. Canada, as you say, are an emerging team, uh, strong. They've got a lot of potential. Uh, their sevens team are very impressive, as we saw in Truman Bodden over the summer. I mean, mm-hmm. the sevens team are on the World Series. They're not to be messed with. Um, and, you know, Canada, and I would say... United States bringing them into the the argument. Um, both teams have huge potential. I mean, if you think about it, the amount of high school players, college players that so- stop playing American football, you know, they have a, potentially a huge pool of players to use. They've already almost cracked the sevens um, scene. The states are arguably in the top two teams in mm-hmm. the world, which is kind of extraordinary in the sh- short period of time. And Canada have that potential as well. So. While, you know, it'll take longer in 15s, definitely, for them to make an impact. It won't be this World Cup, the next World Cup, but it could be in 8, 12 years. It's just a numbers game. I mean, mm-hmm. If the interest levels go up in Canada and the United States, their teams will get better. Well, this is the thing, right? Like, I, and I, this is something that, you know, as, a, as opposed to X's and O's, you know, I'm very transparent. I'm not following the Rugby World Cup, but I, I'm able to digest and have this conversation with you. But what I do know, and this is from talking with Rugby America's North, you know, development officer Scott Harland when he was here uh, for, you know, Gu- the Guyana game, the sevens game, you know, the game is going to like the rugby is going to seven sevens is faster. It's more exciting. It's the games are quicker. So, you know, all it's for me, I look at this as, you know, a Canadian and, you know, a sports report member of the media, although it's good to see Canada, the United States and these Americas regions here, you know, is 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 15s is the interest going down and is sevens interest coming up like does this tournament mean it's only in its ninth year but is it already almost you know like a like an iphone is it already kind of like becoming you know dated because sevens is emerging so quickly as the game of choice for the governing bodies that are rugby like well yeah. like let me ask you because if they're not what i'm saying is if can and the us aren't good at sevens you know obviously being north americans we don't and you're you know obviously you know, from Ireland and Europe, we think that, you know, if we're good at a sport, you know, it's kind of like a cultural thing, right? It's okay if we're not good because we're good at the other one, you know? like Yeah, I know, I know what you're saying. It is, um, it feeds into a, that is a big debate at the moment in rugby because rugby 15s at the moment is kind of having a bit of an identity crisis around the area of safety. We saw a red card in this morning's match for a head high tackle, you know, some would say pretty harsh, but they're bringing in all these protocols. They're They're a little worried at the top level about, you know, the perception of rugby in terms of kids, you know, taking it up at a, a, at an early stage and the risk of injury, etc. And 15s does have a reputation of being particularly brutal because mm-hmm. you, you have more guys on the pitch, there's less room, it is brutally car crash physical at the highest level. Like so, Almost like NFL football, except without the, without the equipment. Well, well, and we I mean, know, you know, you see 
you know, people going into on stage dementia after having a four or five year career in it NFL. Is, I can only imagine. It's only a play. matter of time. I mean, mm. it's only a matter of time. And world rugby know this. I mean, it's just logic. There are head tackles, there are multiple con- concussions, etc. But I mean, that's the 15s game, and they are trying to address it. They know this is coming. They're trying to res- uh, to lower the tackle height, so there's no more of these shoulder high, head high hits. You have to chop around the legs. That's the way it's going to be. That's a positive move. But the, to bring it back to the, ba- the debate versus sevens, sevens, more space, emphasis is on pace, it's on side steps, Athle- And on, more athleticism. Exactly. So, I mean, it's, you know, the sevens is a more exciting game. You know, it is. It has everything. So, I mean, is, is it going to, re- you know, stamp out the 15 a side game? I don't think so. I mm-hmm. still think that, you know, you've got to remember the plus size gents that play uh, 15 a side as well across the world. Mm-hmm. They don't like playing sevens for obvious reasons. So, there's always got to be room for all shapes and sizes in rugby, and that's where 15 is, is always going to be the sport because you have to have eight big forwards on the pitch. So I think 15s will always still have uh, primacy, but sevens is up and coming. It's exciting. That seven series is fantastic. I mean, anyone gets an opportunity. There's legs up in Canada, the United States. It's been in Vegas for years. I think it's going to San Francisco next year. Um, it is brilliant to watch. I mean, mm-hmm. it is a, it's a party weekend, but it's great rugby as well. Yeah, absolutely. Let's take a look at a, a few more games that are left. Uh, of course, Sunday, we already talked about Japan Scotland potential of uh, being canceled. You have, of course, a Group D matchup. Wales undefeated. Shout out to my former roommate, uh, Cool Josh, who is a, from Wales. And they take on uh, Uruguay, who's bottom of, uh, bottom of the pool. Obviously, Wales looking towards the knockout stage. Uh, in Australia there as well, uh, three wins and a loss. Uh, so Wales could, again, top the group and then get better yeah. seeding going into Naco. What do you think of Pool D? Uh, Fiji sitting there at third with uh, with just one win and three losses. Georgia, the same record. And, of course, Uruguay, one win and two losses. Yeah, I mean, Wales are looking good. Six Nations champions this year. The tournament has gone to plan for them. They've had no major injuries. Uh, they beat Australia. Kind of let them come back into the game towards the end. But you know, they had the game won at that stage. They're looking very strong. They're going to play France next weekend. They will be favourites going into that game. They're on the right side of the draw. It, it'll be probably South Africa in the semi-final if going to form. Although hopefully Ireland might have something to say about that. Wales are pretty good favourites to get to a final here. If they keep you know, they keep the same structure, keep their key players. Um, you know, Dan Bigger is playing 10, playing very well. Alan Wynne-Jones is still going in the second row. All their key pieces are there. So they'll probably never get a better chance to get to a final. Um, so your your ex roommate will be um, cool, Josh. He's pumped. I can tell. I can tell. Yeah, and there's I know a couple <laughs> of uh, Welsh guys as well who are who are you know they're bubbling here because uh, it's been a great year for them. The problem with Ireland in many respects, and we could talk for for many shows about the woes of Ireland and how we're worried about the team, etc. Ireland were probably where Wales were last year. They won the Six Nations in 2018. They were bubbling this time last year. But they seem to have gone off peak. Wales are in that driving spot now. And, you know, it, it saddens me a little as an Irishman to say, but Wales are, are looking pretty strong for a, a semi final or a final. Mm-hmm. Let's take a look at a, a Pool C. Of course, I already mentioned England uh, and France cancelled. Doesn't matter because looks like they're both through then, yes? In, in, England, yeah, England deserve um, a very strong mention here. Bar New Zealand, who I'm sure we, we might wrap up on because they are. Still the, the, the clear favourites. England are looking very strong. This break is literally manna from heaven for them now because they believe on Apollo, who's one of their key players, injured. He now gets 14 days to get himself ready for a quarter final against Australia, which England should win. Um, then it, it, it looks like they're going to play New Zealand in the semi-final, which is going to be, I would say, the final effectively. Whoever wins that will win the tournament. Mm-hmm. England, very just a very strong team, very physically strong. They've owned Farrell as captain, is probably... In the top three players in the tournament, he's, a, he's an outstanding player. Very smart coach as well. So mm-hmm. England, again, another painful admission for an Irishman to make. England looking very good as well. Yeah, that's okay, man. No worries. Uh, <laughs> how about Pool B? We've already touched on them, but New Zealand tops the group here with three wins and a draw, followed by South Africa with three wins and one loss. Uh, Italy, uh, Namibia, and my beloved Canada uh, round out Pool B. <laughs> Uh, yeah, look, New Zealand came in as tournament favourites. They've won the last two. A um, few people thought they might be vulnerable coming into the tournament. They're not the team they were four years ago. Um, they've lost a few matches to some of the other contenders in the last few years. But to be honest, it looks um, it looks inevitable that they're going to a semi-final and who'd back against them. They have all their key players back. Bowden Barrett, who was the World Player of the Year, um, 
not last year. He's he's picked it up on a number of occasions. They moved him away from effectively the quarterback position at out half to fullback because they have someone who's just as good as him to play at ten in Richie Mwanga. So they did that three months ago. You know, it just shows you their confidence. It shows you the depth of talent they have. Um, Ardi Savia is another outstanding player in the back row. He's been running riot in the group stages. So to be honest, New Zealand are going to take some stopping. They are the smartest team, the most skillful team. Um, and the gap, which I thought was probably you know coming, it was coming, it was coming closer. Um, it's probably still there. England are probably the only hope I think um, of taking them down in the semi-finals. Apart from that, they're probably going all the way. All right, and then I believe we already talked about Group A, but we can circle back. Uh, your beloved country of Ireland atop with Japan second, followed by Scotland, Samoa, and Russia. Uh, what have you thought of uh, Pool A play? Um, well. Ireland started off uh, very well. Um, as I said, we've been having a bit of a, a national crisis of confidence in the last uh, nine months. Um, our aura has been shattered. We thought we were the best team in the world this time last year. Came into the World Cup a little uncertain. Beat the Scots very convincingly in the first game. Everything looked like it was back to normal. And then we got ambushed by the locals um, a couple of weeks ago now. And to be honest, we've been trying to pick up the pieces ever since. Today, Today's win has has maybe restored a little bit of confidence. But, you know, the odds are, unless we get South Africa, I think South Africa we can beat. We're not favourites, but I think we can beat them because they're quite similar to us. If we get New Zealand, we're not going anywhere. If it is to be Japan uh, that go through, and deservedly so, if they come in, in top spot, they would play South Africa. They beat South Africa um, in Brighton four years ago, one of the biggest shocks ever in, in rugby history. So they, you know, if, if they beat Scotland, I mean, no one's going to want to play them. I mean, South Africa included, uh, because they're going to have a huge crowd behind them. They play good rugby. Uh, they throw it around a bit. They're used to the conditions. I mean, we haven't talked about it, but there's, there's typhoons there for a reason. It's because the humidity is, is so high at this time of year. The Japanese play these conditions really well. The ball is wet. They don't care. They throw it around. They're fitter than most teams. Um, they're going to be a handful tomorrow if the game, please God, goes ahead. And if they get through, they're going to be a handful for South Africa as well. Mm-hmm. So it looks like uh, just according to a quick Google search, the quarterfinals begin next Saturday unless uh, weather conditions push it forward. Semi-final the following Saturday, the 26th, third place match would be uh, on November 1st and the final the next day on the 2nd. So uh, let me ask you this. There's been, a f- I guess, a few upsets just from a uh, f- leisure research that I've done. Also, great job to you. The original email was September 24th with all of your your full top to bottom research so shout out to you man that was a great great stuff i love the passion for sports uh what are the rank the top 3 uh from first second third upsets of this tournament um the biggest one i think was uh was uruguay um they took down fiji i mean that was uh, at the time it kind of got brushed aside but for a tier you talked about Namib- namibia and canada there uruguay would be down at that level and they beat fiji who have got some of the most you know frightening individual talents they might not be the most cohesive team but they have some of the best individual players in the world especially in their back line and Uruguay you know part-time team to come up and beat Fiji was qu- kind of unbelievable so that definitely has gone down as the biggest shock I think uh, and you know the, probably the, the most heartening result to see a, a tier three nation effectively come up and beat Fiji and um, the second one we just touched on is was the ambush ja- Japan beating um beating Ireland mm-hmm. uh, no one saw it coming. Ireland were 20-point favourites going into the game, and they ended up you know, scrambling off the field, lucky to get a bonus point, which has turned out to be very important. But you know, that was a huge win. Um, and just like South Africa before us in 2015, you know, the Japanese, you know, we should have seen it coming. We didn't, and uh, we were beaten. Um, I, don't, I don't know if there's been any other shocks, to be honest. I think everything else is pretty much follows script. I'm trying to think of anything you know, spectacular. I mean, Japan, Scotland tomorrow... You know, going into the tournament, Scotland would have been favourites for that. That's now turned around. Japan are probably going in as slight favourites for that game. Mm-hmm. So um, they've been the kind of standout results, I think. Uh, if you have any questions about the Rugby World Cup or you want to chime in on the conversation, 525-1949 is our uh, WhatsApp. My good friend Campbell, and a staunch listener of Bob FM 94.9, I sent him a message. I go, do you want to talk Rugby World Cup? Any questions for Connolly? says, rubbish that sevens ever take over 15s. <laughs> Uh, sevens is great fun, but 15s is the primary format. And he also sends me a link to why Typhoon Chaos is a storm of world rugby's own making, which yep. is something you touched on. They knew what they were getting into 
doing this in typhoon season in Japan. What? So poor, poor planning yeah. for an event, the only the ninth World Cup. And I think, you know, you think, you think of all, uh, you know, when you look back and any uh, many big events in sports, uh, sometimes you say, wow, why did they just, you think it's easy as an armchair organizer to say, why did they do this? Why did they do that? But, you know, that's one of the first things that you mentioned is that this would, they knew what they were getting into, yes? Correct, yeah. I mean, fly all four teams down to the south of the island. Play the game. Even if it's there's 100 people show up, fly them down south. The supporters don't have to travel if it's difficult. But then you play the games. The players don't feel aggrieved. Um, you know, maybe there's probably a good reason why not. There must be a reason why not. I mean, mm-hmm. But surely, you know, when you're talking about if, if it's too expensive, surely that, you know, that came into the conversation with insurers before a tournament. I mean... This is a high likelihood. How much money do we have to give you in my premium to insure against this game getting rained off for a typhoon or stormed off? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, that's the big question. I'm sure it'll come out, but, I mean, Italy are there getting the flight home now uh, pretty disconsolate, and I just really hope it doesn't happen to Scotland in 24 hours. All right, we're going to wrap on this. You get the last word, sir. Great job in your debut performance on Let's Talk Sports Radio, episode 19. From all you fans listening in Ireland, uh, I want your finals prediction and your winner. Let's go. Uh, finals prediction. It's gonna. I think the last four will be New Zealand, England, uh, and I'm going to put myself out there and say Ireland are going to get through and play uh, Wales in the semi, uh, and it's going to be uh, Wales and New Zealand final, and New Zealand will win it. Very nice. I'm going to say New Zealand and Wales final as well, but I'm siding with Wales for cool Josh, my old roommate. That's right, Josh. I'm behind you 100%. And uh, we'll be following this. And great job, man. Thanks for bringing your A Pleasure. game to Let's Talk Sports Radio. Anytime, anytime. Absolutely. We'll have you back on again. What other sports you like, Connell? Everything. Uh, I'm playing golf later today. Um, like my Gaelic football, as I know you do as well. <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> the, you know, when, when Cayman 27 went down, the people that were hurt most were the Gaelic football community for my sea <laughs> level highlights where I had nothing. Uh, I had a clearly, you know, someone lo- finding their path in the Gaelic media. Uh, yes, as I once referred to. You have your, a lot of supporters in the club, don't worry. I know. As I once referred to your one of your tries as a howitzer off your leg. So. A howitzer, yeah, one of my goals. That went that report went immediately home to Ireland uh, it re- where it received great coverage. Really? Thank, thank what were some of the that. comments? Just, I mean, general probably abuse about my physical shape. <laughs> but, I mean, the howitzer comment. I mean, I, I've got a, that's my, that's all I got left is a big right boot, Jordan. So I appreciate it. <laughs> no worries. Uh, and if you do like golf, hey, shout out to our friends at John Gray High School. They're having a golf tournament Friday, November 29th at North Sound with a noon tea time. They're doing uh, prizes and raffles. It's going to be catered by Casa 43. The best part, Connell, the money goes to help the John Gray athletes to go to their competitions around the region. The, John Gray has some of the best track and field athletes. They play netball. They have really good swimmers. They even have a few basketball players. So our good friend Craig Smith, head of Fizette, is organizing it. Give him a call. Put a team in, 923-7471. Thank you for coming on, Connell. You will be back, and you will be at our ultimate tailgate at the King's Head, uh, which is uh, coming up, uh, which is going to be on the 3rd, Sunday, November 3rd, Free 1981 beer and free food. You're, we're going to watch some NFL. Sound good? Awesome. All right, let's, Jordan, great to be on. Absolutely. And more Let's Talk Sports Radio right here on 94.9 Bob FM. Stick